Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So hi, it's uh, my great pleasure uh, to introduce Alex Rogers from the University of Southampton, uh, who has done some pioneering work in uh, generally AI and uh, autonomous and multi-agent systems. And today he'll be talking about human agent collectives. Okay. Okay. I think, yeah. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah. So so what I want to talk about is a, is a project that's sort of kicked off about a year ago in Southampton. Um, it's on human agent collectives, and it's a, it's a sort of a combination of sort of AI and sort of human interaction. Um, and from the discussions I've had sort of this morning, it seems to be lots of sort of commonalities between some of the work you're doing. So it's sort of a, it's quite interesting to sort of see where, the, where, where things sort of fit into this sort of space. Um, so the project is, is a relatively large. It's an EPSRC-funded program grant. Um, so with sort of a extra con contributions is about sort of 10 million. There's three academic universities, so Southampton. So we do, um, Nick Jennings and I do sort of de decentralized coordination, agent-based systems. Luke Moreau does provenance, and I'll, we'll talk, talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, Oxford, there's Steve Roberts in information engineering, so Bayesian machine learning. Um, and then Nottingham, Tom Rodden, um, who does human-computer interaction. So, the, so the, the essence of the project, which are, we're, so sort of talk about some of the aims in a second is, is just to try and sort of this interaction, trying to build systems in which humans and software entities interact. And, and increasingly, we're sort of, sort of seeing more and more of these. So if you think of sort of applications like crowdsourcing, um, any sort of machine learning application where you're getting in, input from people or you're automating some process and people are part of that process, we're interested in what are the, 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 the fundamental principles that you need to sort of bear in mind if you're going to build those systems? So machine learning, human computer interaction, agent-based computing in terms of handling incentives, handling individual preferences, and how to put all those together into a system. And the key thing is we'd like to try and sort of do some of the, the science, or sort of try and do some of the sort of the, the underpinning theory, but then also sort of demonstrate these within some particular application domains. So the project has a, has a number of application domains. Oh, has a number of application domains. Um, many of them sort of map on to, to things that I know that you're sort of interested in here. So the first one is sort of smart grid. So, so the smart grid is a very sort of interesting application. I'm going to show some of the work we've done in, in home heating optimization. Um, and, and for us, really, the, 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 the interest is that these are systems where potentially you can automate a lot of the process, but people are at the core of them. So if you're automating a home heating system, you're coming down to what are the the human comfort preferences of the householder. Um, there's lots of preferences in here in terms of car use. We've looked at sort of pricing models for, um, for uh, electric vehicle charging so that you've got to handle the incentives of the individuals. You've got the questions where if you ask someone, when do you, when do you want to use your car? And you're going to have some sort of pricing mechanism based on that. How can you incentivize them to give you the correct information? And if you've got the correct information, how can you optimize the system using that? So, so the smart grid is a very interesting setting where explicitly it's decentralized and you have a lot of individual in self-interested stakeholders. So nearly everyone in there, you know, I'm, I'm, I have some interest in how stable the grid is, but what I really want to know is that my things inside my house will operate when, they, when, they, uh, when I want them to. Um, and I may have some global interest about the carbon emissions, but there's lots of individual um, specific self-interest that has to be balanced at the same time. Another sort of key area um, very interested in is disaster response. So disaster response, and you sort of see the, the pattern here. These are all things and people interacting. Um, took a long time to get graphics to try and sort of pull all these things together. Um, so disaster response, we're really interested in coordinating lots of resources, making sense of lots of disparate information sources, and crucially taking account of lots of these information sources are going to be people. So disaster response, when we started working in this a, a few years ago in a different project, um, disaster response was a lot about co autonomously coordinating response, allocating resources. Increasingly, it's become much more about making sense of real-time data that you're getting from the crowd. So disaster response, things like Ushahidi, 
where you've got people on the ground with smartphones giving you information about the, the state of the world. How can you sort of process that in real time and make sense of it? So disaster response has this very interesting sort of crowdsourcing element where you're crowdsourcing information in real time and you need to sort of try and make sense of it and at the same time do resource coordination. Um, and then the last angle, which is sort of very interesting, I'm, I'm going to look at sort of show some examples of both of these bits of work and talk very briefly about, about this one. So citizen science is sort of the nice idea that actually lots of the computation tasks that we'd like to do on a computer are actually quite hard to do on a computer, um, but potentially relatively easy to do for people if we can sort of farm them out to people. So here we're working with the, uh, the Galaxy Zoo, um, Zooniverse people. Um, they take imagery from the Hubble telescope. It's imagery of, of galaxies. What they'd like to do is try and sort of classify those galaxies most simply into, is this a spiral galaxy or is it just a, is it just a sort of shapeless blob? Um, surprisingly, it's very hard to get an algorithm to do that, but actually it's relatively easy for people to do that, and some people are better at it than others. And what you'd like to do is sort of farm those tasks out to people, spot who are the good ones, get their aggregate opinions back, build them together, um, so that you get a good idea of your best classification of what this, this galaxy is. And then crucially, actually sort of act, do some active sampling. Ask the, the, the person, the question, you know, spot the, who's, gonna, who's the person who's best qualified to answer this question. And actually, rather than sort of randomly assign tasks to people, actually actively select, okay, who's the best person to, to answer this task and present them with the problem. So, so citizen science is a very interesting aspect. And, and there's a lot, here, there's a lot of work sort of actually trying to trying to build probabilistic models of the humans. So if we know more about the human, how can we, um, uh, how can we make best use of them as, a, as a, some sort of, sort of human computation resource? Can we model how well they perform? Um, and then also we'd like to have, actually have a sort of a, uh, what we call a sort of accountable information infrastructure. How do we keep track of all of this? If, we've got, if we're farming out questions to people, people are making decisions on the basis, you know, not, maybe not the best informed decisions. They are citizen scientists, they're not professional scientists. How can we keep track of all of that and actually sort of backtrack if we discover that someone has sort of given us some, some information that is discovered later to be, to be false? How can we backtrack and discover what decisions we made on the basis of it? So this is sort of most evident in, in terms of citizen science, but actually also in disaster response. So if we get some new information, how can we look at all the decisions we've made on the basis of some old Prior, our prior state of knowledge and actually backtrack, figure out which, decision, which decisions we've made need to, be, uh, need to be sort of recast. So that's the setting. And what, and what I want to do, try and do in the, in the talk is sort of really sort of in, in much more detail sort of describe some work that we've done in these first two and sort of touch very briefly on, on here um, and really sort of talk about some of the applications a bit more. So some of the, a lot of the work we do is sort of algorithmic. We, you know, we publish at sort of AAAI, IJCHI, um, NIPS, ICML, those sort of algorithmic sort of machine learning type conferences. Um, and what I want to show here is sort of how we're trying to sort of take some of that and sort of build it into, into, the, into, into applications. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is the smart grid. Um, and the focus here is really around home heating. Um, so if you're going to do anything around sort of uh, um, reducing sort of carbon emissions in the UK, there's a few sort of headline things to try and tackle. One is transport, which is probably about 40% sort of, 40 40 of UK emissions. Um, and the other one is sort of domestic heating. So domestic heating is surprisingly 27% of UK CO2 emissions. So it's a, it's a very significant part of emissions. Um, and it's typically, it's a thing that's very poorly understood by consumers and the information flows are very poor. So most people have very little understanding of what their thermostat is doing. Um, and their only real sort of connection with how much anything is costing is when they get their bill sort of every three months um, and it's very hard for them to actually sort of understand the linkage between the two and actually know, you know, what, 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 what could they do? What actionable um, difference could they make? Um, you know, that we're all told, just turn your thermostat down, but that will save you X. But how do we know that? Can we, can we spot homes which are poorly insulated and actually advise someone, give them specific information that if you insulate your home and bring it up to average, you will save X on the basis of the, of the data that we've seen. So what we'd like to try and do is improve these information flows. Um, and crucially, this is sort of becoming sort of more pertinent. So one of the key aims to, or one of the key drivers of reducing CO2 emissions is to try and electrify um, heating and transport. So everyone's sort of very familiar with electrifying transport. So we have electric vehicles, and uh, an electric vehicle is 
significantly more, more energy efficient than a carbon uh, um, internal combustion engine. But heating is another sort of key area which there's a move to try and electrify using sort of air or ground source heat pumps. So these are like fridges that run backwards. So rather than actually burning um, fossil fuels in your condensed boiler, you'll have a, an air source heat pump which sort of works like a, like a fridge or an air conditioner backwards and will sort of take the, the heat out of the air. Um, and the challenge with these things is that the, the heat output from them is very much lower than we're used to with a heating system. So if you come home to a cold house, it's very easy to turn your heating on full. You get sort of 15 kilowatts of heat instantly and the house warms up very quickly. It's not clear that these things will produce anything like that. So there's going to have to be much more sort of a coordination sort of scheduling um, aspect to them. They'll, they'll have to sort of preempt your, your return to the house um, and understand how long it's going to take your house to warm up um, and, and preheat accordingly. So, so, the, so, so these drives are sort of pushing it away from this very responsive heating systems that we have now towards something that just needs a little bit more sort of coordination and scheduling. So what we've been trying to do is trying to look at, okay, what's the state of the art now? And, and could we provide some system now that will look at an existing heating system and try and predict what the consequences of using that heating system are. So what we'd like to be able to do is actually provide some feedback to someone, not change the boiler or anything now, but actually provide feedback to them. If they turn the thermostat down by X degrees, they're going to save a certain amount of money. If they change the way that they're scheduling their timer or not using it in the middle of the day, how much effect will it have? So in order to do that, we need to, there's a few things that we need to predict. So, so one of them is we need to sort of predict external parameters. So what is it that is external to the home that's, that's driving the, the, the cost of the heating? And, and the two things that we look at here are going to be sort of the external air temperature um, and also the carbon intensity of the grid. So we're, most of the work we've done is with real sort of gas um, boilers at the moment, but if it's electrified, actually the, the carbon intensity of the grid is something that will actually sort of change in real time. So being able to, to, to schedule around that is sort of quite interesting. We like to learn something about the thermal properties of the home, and, and we'll look at some approaches to, to doing that. And one of the key things that we're really interested in is how can we combine a statistical model and a physical model. So we know some about, something about the physics of how a home leaks heat to the outside. We have some observations that we can get from sensors. How can we combine a statistical model and a, and a, and a suitably sort of parameterized physical model? Um, and then once we've got those, how can we sort of predict and, and optimize the heating? I'm going to sort of talk about a few of those and then sort of show a demo of, of, of that sort of working in a, in a simulated environment and then talk about how we're, how we're trying to do that for real. Okay, so the first thing in, in sort of predicting environmental parameters, so as soon as when you sort of start to talk about um, predicting heating performance with people, um, very quickly you're, you hear this thing, oh well, I, you know, my house is in a microclimate. Everyone claims that their house is in some sort of microclimate that isn't captured by the... Uh, um, the, 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 the weather forecast that you get online. So one of the first things we looked at doing was, okay, well, weather forecasts are clearly useful. So if, you, if you've got a statistical record of your house over the last week, you know, that's going to tell you something about what the weather is going to be tomor tomorrow. Um, but clearly there's some, there should be some, inf some useful information in a, in a weather forecast. Um, so the first thing we looked at is sort of how could we sort of combine those two things together? So if we have some local observations from my own sensor and I have an online weather forecast, how can I sort of put the two together? Um, so this is some real data uh, from my home. And you can sort of see, so this is one day plotted against the previous day. So, you know, there, there is some correlation. So a nice sort of straight line would mean that days are nicely sort of predictable. Um, what happened at five o'clock yesterday is a good predictor of what happens tomorrow at five o'clock. Um, and it's not bad, you can sort of see a, there's a diagonal up here. This is the weather forecast data, so it's, you can sort of see the, the, um, the rounding, which is due to the weather forecast is, is rounded off at, at whole um, degree C units. And again, there's some sort of diagonal, so there's clearly a correlation between the, uh, what the forecast says and what actually happens, but it's not absolutely perfect. Okay, so the, so the first thing that we've, we've been looking at is sort of how can we combine these things together? So how can we combine a sensor, set of sensor observations and also another time series which we believe to be correlated and crucially another time series which we have a forecast for. So, so this second time series can be anything at all and when we look at the carbon intensity that sort of turns out to be really useful. So but for, the, for the external temperature we've basically got our historic observations from our sensor at the home and what we'd like to do is sort of predict what's going to happen tomorrow 
or for the rest of the day. What we've got is a, an online weather history, so we can look at what was the temperature, but that crucially that temperature is at the local weather center. So this is, this is my home is in the New Forest and the local weather center, center is in Brockenhurst, is in sorry, Southampton. So we have a, an observation of the temperature at Southampton, which is some degree correlated with the temperature at my home. Um, but then crucially, I have a prediction for this. Okay? So I have a prediction for one thing which I believe to be correlated to the time series that I really want to predict. Um, and there's a number of ways that you combine these together. So the one way that we've been looking at, which is sort of turns out to be really nice, is using a multi-output Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process allows you to parameterize features of time series, but at a very high level. So basically, we, 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 we make some quite high level assumptions about these time series. One is that it's smooth, so there's some correlation. One measurement in time is in some way correlated with, a, with the next measurement in time. There's some correlation length that defines how smooth it is. And also, there's some typically some daily periodicity. So 5 o'clock today will, will tell me something about 5 o'clock tomorrow. It looks somewhat like 5 o'clock yesterday. So there, there's some daily periodicity. And this, the strength of that periodicity, we don't really know. So we might be in a nice sort of stable regime where every day looks very much the same. And then we can expect them to be very correlated. In a, in a very sort of changeable setting, we may lose that correlation and one day doesn't look very much like the next. And then we've got the, the, observe, the, the, the online weather forecast. And, and, and the only assumption we make is that actually the, the, the weather forecast might be correlated with this time series. Okay? So in this case, we're, they're the same thing. One is a, they're both temperatures, but that doesn't need to be the case. The other thing we've been looking at is predicting carbon intensity of the grid, where we have observations of carbon intensity. We want a prediction of carbon intensity. We also have observations of the total demand on the grid that we can get from the national grid. And very nicely, the national grid also predicts, gives us a prediction of the demand. So those two things we can put together within exactly the same model. So even though they're not measuring the same thing anymore, one is, a, one is you know, gigawatts, the other one is kilograms of CO2 um, uh, per kilowatt hour. They're sort of completely different things, but they're correlated. So we can exploit that correlation. Um, so this approach works quite well. Um, the difference is relatively small. So if you look at the difference, you know, uh, uh, the, our multi-output Gaussian process improves on significantly on just using our observation of yesterday. You get down to, you can sort of carry on tweaking, and you get down to sort of a two-degree error. Um, how significant that is at the end of the day, it's a bit hard to say. But clearly, there is there's some improvement in actually looking for correlated data series and exploiting the extra information that we've got. So, so it's quite a nice trick, and it sort of it works quite well in this setting. So that's the first thing we've got. Now we've got a prediction of the temperature. The other thing that we'd like, oops, the other thing that we'd, we'd now like to do is, is, is try and learn something about the thermal properties of the house. Okay? So, so we've done initially this in simulation, and then I'll sort of show you some real data. So this is a, a sort of simulation of a house. It simulates the thermal properties of a, of a simple house with a very simple sort of physics model. Um, and this is the physics model that we'd like to try and learn. So this is a, a model of heat flows within the home. And this is probably the, very, the simplest sort of physical model you could sort of come up with. So basically, you've got this is the heat into the, into the house. So we're assuming that the house is just one, one big room. There's some heater input. There's an indicator function, which is whether the heater is on or off at that particular time. There's some leakage. So the leakage is proportional to the difference between the internal temperature and the external temperature with some parameter. And then there's some noise, which sort of factors in all the, all the stuff that we don't know. And then that heater, that heat input, results in some change in the, in the temperature. So it's just the, the thermal capacity of the air and, and the mass of the air. So this is sort of the simplest sort of model of sort of home heating sort of leakage that you can come up with. Um, and basically, lots of these models sort of correlate with very simple electrical circuits. So this is the equivalent of electrical circuits. So, so here we've got a, a fixed voltage, which is the temperature outside. We've got a current source, which is the heater. We've got a capacitor, which is the, 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 the voltage across this capacitor is the temperature inside the home. And then there's some leakage to the outside with this resistor. So, so these, these, these sort of heating, the differential equations that describe heating are exactly the same as the differential equations that describe these sort of simple RC circuits. Um, increasingly, you can sort of add more and more complexity. So other things that you can add in, you can add in leakage to a sink, which is sort of leakage to, uh, to, the, to the ground. 
You can add in leakage to the envelope of the house, which then leaks to the outside. You can leak to the internal um, furniture within the home, which then leaks back into the, into the home. Um, and you can have delays and lags around the heating system. So the heating system heats water, which then leaks heat into the home. So you can, you can add more and more complexity to these models. Um, as you add more, more parameters, as you add more complexity, there's more parameters to learn. This sort of very simplest model that we learn, remember, these are observations. So we know what the, if we've got a time series, we know what the internal temperature is, the external temperature. We know what the heating system was doing. So we can very easily learn what these parameters are. We don't need to worry about the size of the home or, the, or this. We can, this sort of just gets folded into these parameters. So what we're left with is just sort of trying to learn the heater input parameter and the, the leakage rate in the simplest model. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like from, for my home. And there's, there's a whole host of ways you could do this learning. This is, this is sort of simple sort of enumeration of the whole search space. You can sort of see it's got this sort of nice diagonal nature, which sort of says that uh, a very strong heater and a very high leakage rate looks about right. And also a very weak heater and a very low leakage rate looks about right. But there is a, there's a best, best spot in the middle. Um, and you, so this is complete enumeration of the search space, but you can do it in a much cl more clever way. So if you've got more parameters, this becomes obviously sort of comp you know, exponentially expensive, but uh, you can cast this as a Kalman filter and just do an iterative update. Every time you get a new observation, you, you re-estimate what these parameters are. Um, so this works very well. Um, some, of the, some of the challenges, well, which, what model to use? You've got a, an increasing complexity of, of model, and what you find very quickly is that the, the models become unphysical. So if you build in a model of all of the features, so you have the heater feeding heat into, the, into water in the heating system and that water leaking into the inside, when you, you, when you run it, you very quickly get sort of overfitting of the model and you find lots of unphysical parameters. So you find that the, the, the water in the heating system is at 300 degrees C. Um, so things that you know it, uh, are, are obviously false. So you could fix some of that with a, with a sort of a, a Bayesian approach and sort of put priors over some of these parameters. Um, the, one of the approaches that we've been sort of looking at recently, which, is, which I think is sort of a really nice approach, is this latent force model. So, so we do this in the, in the same space as the Gaussian process. So we're, we're, we're setting up a, a, a model, a Gaussian process-like model, which uses these simple differential equations. So if we stick to the simple model, which is a very simple differential equation, we can do this. And then crucially, we can have a latent force. So all the things that we don't know about we can wrap up into this latent force. And that latent force ends up capturing two things. So it, so it captures things that we don't actually have an explicit model for. So typically that might be sort of solar heating of the house. So if there's some extra heat source or heating from cooking, that gets folded in to the latent force. The other thing that the latent force ends up capturing is the failure of the model. So, so the real house won't behave in the simple way that our simple differential equation describes, but the, the trick that we want to exploit is the fact that this failure and these extra heating sources are likely to be periodic. So what you can sort of see here, this is a real trace from one of the homes that we're monitoring. These are, this is when the heater system is coming on. This is the internal temperature, so you can sort of see it comes on in the morning, it's dying away, then it comes on in the evening, goes off for the evening, and then repeats. This is over two days. And this thing here is the, is the residual that we've learnt from that. And what we've done is we forced this residual to be periodic. So we've said, okay, well, every day is going to fail in about the same way. So the way the model failed yesterday is probably going to be the way it's going to fail tomorrow. So we force a periodic prior onto this residual. So this is the latent force, the extra heat that's going into the house. We force it to be residual. And if you look at it, the things that it's capturing are, you, you can sort of see these big spikes every time the heater comes on and off. And so what this is capturing is the lag in the heating system. So our, our simple physical model doesn't capture any, doesn't explain the fact that the heater comes on, but then there's a delay before the temperature change um, starts to occur. Or the fact that at the other end, when the temperature goes off, the, 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 the heating is off apparently, but the temperature is still rising because there's hot water still circulating in the pipes. So this sort of captures that. You can sort of see these sort of big consistent features. So this sort of overnight, this is, this is where the temperature is dropping away, decaying in the house overnight. And you can sort of see that you get these sort of very sort of characteristic features. Stuff in here is there's a lot of noise, but this is sort of a very consistent feature. You can sort of see it just going off the, off the plot over here. And that's the fact that our simple model doesn't really describe the decay of the temperature in the house. 
You know, the, the decay is much simpler than just leaking to the outside. It's, in my house, it's actually leaking to, the, to a sink, which is the ground. It's leaking to the envelope, and there's also some extra heat within the house from, from the fridge and refrigeration and things like that. Um, so you, you can build a model and parameterize it, and you, you learn those things. But actually, we, we end up being able to predict just as well without actually having to go to all that complexity. We, we basically just use this, that very simple model, and then we hope that the way that the model fails yesterday is the same way it's going to fail today, so we can correct our predictions on that basis. Okay. So now we've got those two things. We've got a, a prediction of what's going to happen outside um, tomorrow or to the end of the day. We've got a, a thermal model of the home, and then we can sort of start to do some sort of useful things with it. So, so here we've got our, our simulator running. So we're, we're simulating these algorithms. We're running these algorithms on a simulated um, house. So we're generating data, but the weather data is real data. So the the thermal characteristics we've, we've set in a simulator, but the, it's, this is going to be driven by some real weather data. Um, so the first thing that, that there's our sort of home heating system is doing is it's learning those thermal parameters. So it's starting off, it's just acting. So this is sort of the, the interface that you might have. Um, so it's, it's sitting there, it's watching what the house is doing. So it's watching when the, heating, the existing heating system is going on and off, just operating as a thermostat, looking at the temperature changes and building this probabilistic model. So, if I so this is sort of what's happening behind the scenes. So what we're doing here, we're, this is the, the sort of Kalman filter approach. This is sort of a histogram of what we think the leakage rate and the heater output is. So we're learning these things over time. What you can sort of see here, this is the, the set point. This is the, 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 the thermostat just sort of cycling at that, that set point. This is the external temperature. The curves here, the blue bit is when we when we want comfort, the green bit is when we want heat, when the heating, the timer is actually set to be on, and this red bit is when the uh, when the heating, the heater is actually generating heat. So you can sort of see in this bit here, the heat is going on and off to try and sort of maintain the temperature, and we sort of come back to those. And so the, the key thing you can see here, so here's our external temperature prediction. So the grey bit is our uncertainty. So the nice thing about the Gaussian process is we have a prediction, we have some prediction uncertainty. Um, this is the carbon ten intensity, so these predictions aren't particularly good at the moment because we're only sort of a couple of days in. They get a little bit better as you give it a little bit more time to learn. Okay, so now we've learnt what these parameters are. So the first thing that we can start to do is we can start to sort of try and provide some feedback. So one of the things we can do is we can provide a, a cost prediction. So if I set my thermostat to 20 degrees, it's going to cost me £1.71 today. Um, and as I change the temperature, I can, you, can, you can calculate what the, what the total cost over the day will be, and also in carbon. So this is a sort of a predictive feedback. So we're not, we're not saying how much you're using now. We're, going to, we're saying how much you're going to have used by the end of, end of the day, which is a little bit more useful to the householder. And then the other thing you can do is turn that around. So say, OK, well, I only want to spend pound fifty today. So do your best. Set the thermostat to, to the best that you can. And it will use that prediction, it will model the impact of these decisions and come up with the, the, the appropriate temperature. Okay, so that's, that's, so that's relatively simple. So we're just we're using a prediction and we're just operating as a thermostat still. The slightly sort of more useful thing to do is then to try and sort of explicitly optimise. Okay, so here we're assuming that there's some critical pricing period. So we've got some smart meter, we're in some sort of smart grid setting. There's a, the, the price of electricity isn't constant. Um, and here there's a, there's a critical pricing period in the, in the evening. So heating is, is more, or electricity is more expensive in the evening. Our agent is, or our home heating system, is planning around that. So what you can sort of see it doing over here, this is its, that critical pricing period. And what it's trying to do is heat the home up before that critical pricing period, let the temperature sort of decay over that period, and then heat it up a little bit more to sort of maintain the comfort. And, and the, the vertical... We've sort of uh, extended the, 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 expanded out the deviations here so you can sort of see them a little bit clearer. But what you sort of should see in a minute, we're now in that critical pricing period. So the agent has sort of warmed the home up before. It's doing its best to sort of maintain a little bit of temperature. And then it lets the temperature decay away to try and minimize the amount of heat that it uses over that period. So this is using a model. So we have a probabilistic model of what's actually going to happen outside. We've got a model of the thermal properties of the house, and then we can optimize that in any way we like. So we can do this sort of, this is the same thing here, optimizing the um, electricity cost. So heat up the house, try and maintain it, let the temperature decay. 
So we try and minimize how much energy we use over that period. This is sort of doing the same thing for carbon intensity. There turns out to be not so much you can do with carbon intensity. It sort of it gradually ramps up over the day. So this is sort of the, 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 the optimization that it's come up with, which is sort of heat up more in the morning. You know, we've got this sort of slightly unusual case where we just want heat all day, we want comfort all day, and then let the temperature sort of decay over the day. Okay, and the, and the, the vertical sort of deviations here is sort of expanded because we've, we've relaxed sort of the constraints on that. We have a, a sort of a comfort model that tries to, tries to minimize those or uh, gives you an acceptable bound at which you can manipulate the temperatures around. Okay, so, so this sort of has some you know, reasonably significant effects. So in, in, at least in, the simp in, the, in our simulation, which we believe is sort of performs reasonably close to a, to, a, to a real home, we get sort of something around sort of 20% savings in cost. And a, and a lot of that is down to actually optimizing when you do the heating. So preheating at the appropriate time. And, and in this case, with a critical pricing period, actually sort of making, being able to optimize around that critical pricing period. So a, a typical approach might be just to turn off the heating at that critical pricing period, but actually we do a little, you know, we're a little bit more clever than that where we, we, can, we know it's coming, we can heat up appropriately beforehand, model how much it's going to decay away over the critical pricing period, um, and then try and do the best that we can, either in terms of cost or carbon. So this sort of seems to work quite nicely in terms of simulation. What we're, what we're doing now is we have some homes in Southampton that we've metered. Um, so over the winter, we've been recording minute by minute set point activity, therm the heater activity, so we, we've instrumented the boilers, so we know every minute whether the boiler, boiler was firing at that point. Um, we've got some interesting data on how people typically use these heating systems, which, is, which did, isn't really how we'd expect them. No, very few people actually found the timer. Most of them are just sort of turning it up and down manually on the, on the thermostat, um, which, which, which is a bit, makes our predictions much harder. Um, and the thing that we're trying to do now is to sort of build this into, into something that we can try out next winter. So we like to try and sort of optimize these ho the thermal, the, the, the heating in these homes next winter on the basis of the data that we've got now. And the, and the data that we've got now is sort of helping to inform these models, sort of trying to give us a handle on how, how good the, our prediction has to be. Okay, so that's the, that's the sort of smart grid aspect. And the, and, and, the, and the key thing there is the sort of nice interaction between machine learning and human agent interaction. So, so we've done quite a lot on the, on the building the models. Um, the work that's also progressing at the moment is actually sort of, you know, how should you present this back to the user? You know, the, the thermostats are notoriously, have notoriously hard for people to understand. So, you know, I tell the story, I stayed in a hotel um, a couple of weeks ago where the thermostat had instructions, there were extra instructions stuck onto the thermostat on the desk in the hotel room, there were extra instructions on how to use the thermostat. So, you know, the only thing in the room that you needed three sets of instructions for was the thermostat, and, 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 and it, you know, there's not much you can do. It's, it's one knob, you turn it up and down. Um, but it, these interfaces are notoriously hard for people to understand, normally because they have very poor sort of mental models of how the heating system works. Um, so we're working with a, with a sociologist who's sort of interviewing the people and trying to understand, you know, what's the model that the person has in the head of how their heating system works, how the thermostats works, and how is that influencing how they're, they're actually using it. So that's sort of quite an interesting aspect. Okay, so, I'm gonna, so that's just some, an example of the smart grid work. What I want to talk about, another sort of brief example. Yeah. What sort of pricing model were you assuming when you were yeah. figuring out the saving sort of effects of policies? Yeah, so we, so we looked at a critical pricing period, which is probably more characteristic of a, of a hot country with a cooling. Um, with air conditioners, so so the model that we, so we so with gas there's no critical pricing because you can store it anyway. Um, critical pricing period is sort of more significant with electricity, and actually the 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 the, the real impact on here is probably in a hot country with cooling, um, but we don't have the data for that. So so the, but so critical pricing periods to turn off air conditioners is, is a is is typically uh, there, there's already lots of results on that. There's understanding of how, how well that works and the fact that actually pre-cooling before, you know, everything's the same, you just stick a minus sign into the, fit, into the model. Um, actually pre-calling before the critical pricing period is sort of, is the significant thing to do. So Australia has quite a lot of example of critical pricing periods to try and minimize air conditioner use at peak times. So it, 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 would, be, yeah. so it would be interesting to actually see what is the equilibrium behavior because once people sort of adapt to this, uh, sort of uh, take this policy, then uh, companies might change their rates, yeah. right? Because I mean, they they they, they don't have that uh, sort of critical period. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so lots. So people have done sort of um, 
so, the, so there are studies where, where you, you have an automatic switch on the, on the, uh, on the air conditioner and, and the lesson there is all it does is move the peak. So, so and, and typically it moves the peak till after the critical period. So everyone's house is extra hot and then the air conditioner comes on full whack to try and cool it down and all you've done is sort of shift the peak to a little bit later. In a sense here we sort of shift the peak earlier um, and, you, and you'd need some, you would need to worry about the equilibrium state. And, and actually sort of existing um, uh, economy seven, where you have these dual rates, they, they randomize the switching time so that not everyone's sort of heating comes on at the same time. So, so the existing, so the radio signal is, is, is slightly randomized so that, so that you don't have everyone's heating system switching on at the same time and creating all these sort of false peaks. But we have some work looking at exactly that. And one of the, and one of the, one of the lessons for crit, you, actually a critical pricing period is, is a pretty crude tool. What you really want is sort of real time pricing but real-time pricing is very hard for anyone to, 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 to respond to. So, so real-time pricing with a fully automated system that can respond to it and find a nice equilibrium is the sort of the end game, but it's, it's not clear how you actually get to that, that point. On, on the, um, the thermostat controls, yeah. uh, it seems to me with my limited experience that the problem with those things is the limited input devices. If you could just Run it with a screen and a mouse. Yeah, yeah. It would be easy. You could explain it. Is, are you not? You're not looking at that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this, um, so this is a, this is an interface. This is an iPhone interface. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this is a small sort of startup, Moitza, who have a, a home energy system, um, and they have a, you know, you take your thermostat off, you put a little sort of an, their box on, um, and then you have an interface, um, and, and that sort of that's, that solves a, a lot of the issues. Um, the thing that sort of interests me is sort of how, how much you can do without actually sort of, um, with, the, with the minimal change within the home. So one of the things I'm interested in is actually maybe not actually sort of replacing controllers, but could we give someone, a, could, we, could we sense something very cheaply and provide some feedback without actually having to, people to install complex controllers? So, so there is a market for sort of complex controllers and people like to, you know, to, to, you, know they're, they're, you can buy passive systems will sell you sort of, heaters, controllers that do some of these things. Um, I'm just a little, this, this, this smart home vision just always seems a long way off though. And I think there's a, it, it will take a long time for that to get into people's homes. So it's sort of interesting as to um, how quickly people will actually sort of be comfortable with, with automating that. Completely different question, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit boggled that you're not measuring the thermal capacity of the house as a separate thing. Because by lumping it in with that lateral forcing, whatever you call yeah. it, um, and forcing that to be periodic, you know, you can see that it's linked to when the heating comes on and off. Yeah. And you're about to change when the heating comes yes. on and off, and yeah. therefore it's not going to work. Yeah. And I've been looking at, for example, using thermal storage in houses to um, Im improve, uh, optimise use of electricity um, for off-peak for, you know, for underfloor heating and stuff. Yeah. And, and it's exactly what you need. Yeah, so, so, I, so, 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 yeah, so, so there's probably a, so there's a mix of things that we're trying to do here. So... so, uh, so um, so one, my, my preference is to try and do it with the minimum sensing that you can. Um, so, so what could you do just sensing at one place? And the, and the best place to sense is at the thermostat because that's the thing that's determining the heating cost at the moment. So if, you have, if someone's existing, you know, the thermostat may be in the wrong place, but actually the fact that you set it to 20 degrees, that's determining your, your cost. So if you can model the, 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 the thermal properties of the house at that point on the wall, you have a good understanding of how that turns into a into a heating cost, but uh, and and I and I think there is space for actually sort of producing a more um, a more physically informed model. Um, the challenge is how much information do you need about the home to do that. So my preference would be to what can we do without asking the homeowner anything, um, and then maybe you actually need more information. So maybe if you're going to parameterize this model, you know, is it a house put on a concrete slab, and that might be able to inform the model in the leakage to the floor, and you can begin to sort of put priors over some of the parameters of the model. If you're measuring the internal external temperature, and you're measuring how much energy is going into the system in terms of the heating. Yeah. Then you can work, and the, then you can work out what the thermal gain is. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. one, yeah. So one. Of, I mean, the key thing, the other thing is the, is the leakage rate. So, so, we, so we get good good measurements of how quickly the heat leaks out of the house, um, which either tells you it's a house which is where, which is useful. Um, so either it's a very leaky house, or it's a, it, which, which is one possible explanation, or it's a house which has 
which is very insulated inside so that the heat doesn't leak to the structure very quickly. And there's a... You, you, get, you get the leakage from the steady state. You get the capacity, the thermal capacity from the dynamic, from, from the change in turning it on. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't so see why you'd need extra, extra information, extra sensor data in order to determine the thermal capacity. So in terms, so so we, so we, so we, we sort of, we effectively we do model the thermal capacity. I mean, we know we 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 know how much it, how much the heating is going to be reduced by two. If you decrease the, the set point by two degrees, delay. Delay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if you turn turn the if you have a, a nice sort of schedule, and then tomorrow you're going to have the same schedule, but you're going to reduce the set point by by two degrees. We can calculate how much heating how how much you're going to save on heating by doing that because we know what the leakage rate is going to be at 18 degrees as opposed to 20 degrees. We know how much heater output, we know what that we've parameterized the heater output, so we know percentage wise how much of the time it needs to be on. So we can, so we can turn, so in, so in a sense we are coming up with thermal capacity of the house in terms of its response to the heating system. I have to think about this some more. I'm not, yeah. I'm not convinced that I think about it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, you know you, you will be waiting for like a smart grid, and that's a very you know future thing. But yeah. I don't really see why in the proposal. And I apologize, I, I came in a bit late. Maybe there was uh, something more before. But given what I saw, I do not understand why this could not be applied house by house on the basis that there is a smart meter present in the house, which can be done for you know one house in in the neighborhood or one house in the whole city. It doesn't actually require any infrastructure support. No, no. So, 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 no. So, in, in terms of the the modelling of the response to the critical pricing period, you know, there there will, um, I mean, there's economy seven, but that's the only variable tariff that that people are sort of exposed to at the moment. So, so once you've got smart meters, there is this sort of scope for more sort of varied thing. Um, in a sense, we're we're looking somewhere into the future in the sense that, you know, most heating at the moment is is 97% is is gas fired condenser boilers. Um, so. And, and there's, no, there's, there's never going to be any pricing criticality for, um, for gas because it's a storable commodity. Um, so in a sense that you don't have to optimize over your, your use in that way, but actually you do want to optimize in terms of when you actually want to want heat or when, when you want comfort. So there, the, the optimization then is useful. So you know, how early do you put the heating on to make sure you're at set point when you want it? Um, the, the work you're doing on sort of a... Uh, predict if, occupancy. So if you know that no one's in, sort of let it cool down and actually know, okay, well, if they're going to be back at six o'clock, what time do I need to look, turn the heating on so that I'm back at set point before they arrive? So all of that sort of prediction and modeling you can apply now to a, to a, to a normal sort of heating system. But some of the, the, the stuff around optimizing over a, a, a gas or, or electricity that, that has a variable price so at t different times, you know, that, that requires you know, we don't have that market for electricity yet. Yeah. So, but um, sharing your prediction with the grid operator will it eventually allow it to improve its its process, and that might that might be something you want to do to share your prediction on oh the, yes on local consumption, and if everybody does that uh, at the operation level in the infrastructure. Uh, you can optimize the production process. Yeah, so we have some we have some sort of related work which is sort of around um, around that. If you getting trying to get, trying to elicit predictions of energy consumption from homes, um, because the better electricity is a good example. The better prediction you have of of the demand for tomorrow, the better you can trade, um, and you get a better price for it. Um, so actually, sort of having and 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 within the home, you always have a better understanding of what your energy use tomorrow is going to be than someone from outside because you know what your schedule is, you know what your calendar is. So, we, so we've looked at sort of, you know, how, what's the value in that extra information and then how could you be paid for that extra information? Um, and there's sort of really interesting incentives, you know, if you, if you, you, you want to be careful that the, 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 you don't encourage people to turn on extra loads to, to get back up to their prediction because they're sort of going to, they're, they're going to fall beneath their prediction and they want to sort of, you know, um, you know, they, 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 they increase their reward by being a reliable predictor. Um, so you have to worry about those incentives. Um, but it's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting aspect in the sense that the grid and your energy com company would have, would, their performance would be improved if they had a good prediction of how much energy you're going to use. So actually telling them that has some value. Um, so, you know, it should have some value to you as well. Uh, a quick reminder, 
Nest. Yes. You know it. Yeah. And I think it's very close, but on top of that, they, they try to estimate the occupancy as well of the yeah. house. So. Yeah. So we're so we we're doing so we we have um so have a student who's looking at um using smart meter data to dis disaggregate appliances, um, which and that works sort of reasonably well. You can sort of recognise key appliances with sort of one minute data, um, and then the obvious thing to do from that is actually okay. Well, can you sort of estimate occupancy um, from that? So that's sort of quite a nice thing. Where, you know, how much can you you predict without any extra sensors? Um, so the Nest thing is quite nice. You know, they have a little sort of uh, occupancy sensor within the device. Um, there's probably some nice sort of machine learning problems in terms of inferring occupancy when you've only got one sensor. Um, or the other model is you just deploy lots of sensors around the home and 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 try and get absolute ground truth as to as to whether people are in the house. Uh, I have one last question. Do you, do you think it's acceptable to raise the temperature in the house? Uh, because you, you, the comfort level is not very good. If you, you know that you are going to face a, a high pricing in the coming hours, yeah. your idea is to rise the temperature and then to stop and then you... Yeah, so, so, the, yeah, so, the, so the key... Yeah, so I mean the key thing that's missing is a, is a good model of comfort. And that's, the, and that's the thing that no one really has a very good you, handle you, on. You, you have some... Uh, so, so, yeah, so... I can't give you a pointer on that, but basically you have to maintain one temperature level. So that, well, that's one model. So, so we that, use that's the, the most uh, yeah. So we so, use in architecture. Yeah. So we use the ASHRAE model of yeah. comfort, um, and we look at an aggregate comfort over over a period. Um, so the ASHRAE model just penalises is basically a deviation away from a an optimal set point. Um, and then what we're doing is we're we we try to ensure over a certain period that our aggregate comfort is the same as we'd have without doing without doing the deviations. Um, but that, that model of comfort is very sort of ill-defined. I think that's the, you know, the real thing you want to do is sort of try and model the, the user's um, you know, dissatisfaction as the temperature varies. Um, you know, how some people are going to be more, more susceptible to deviations in temperature, some people won't really care. And actually, that's, that, trying to elicit that comfort information seems to be a really sort of really challenging task. The current model allows you to boil someone and feed them over, and that's, that's <laughs> absolutely fine. Uh, <laughs> up to a degree. <laughs> and then beyond that, yeah, yeah, there, there's, yeah. So, so, the, so, so, so the so the ASHRAE models is a uh, is a uh, is very simple. It's just deviation from a set point, um, but it's it's there's an exponent which is more than one. So, you deviation, de yeah. So deviations are worse than staying at the set point, but there's some sort of there's some leeway in that. Um, so if you're a little bit, on average, a little bit more comfortable, you can sort of tolerate some, some deviations. Um, but how well that actually sort of maps to real people's comfort is, seems to be an open question. So I'm a little bit sceptical about that. And actually, the data that we've done sort of on looking at real people, how real people use their heating systems, actually the benefits are much lower down the, the scale. Actually telling people, your heating is on all the time. You know, <laughs> try turning it off at night. You'll save 40%. Those are... You know, you know, though, though, there's very quick, very significant wins just from doing that. Um, most people just don't really know what their heating system is doing. You know, the f fact that you know, having your heating system at 24 is quite high. You know, telling people how they compare to the average is there's, there's sort of quite significant sort of gains just from doing that. Um, are we have time? I think we're almost done. <laughs> so very qu I'll, I'll skip through this very quickly. Um, so, 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 yeah, actually, I'll just show the video. Um, so one thing, so another sort of area, the disaster response sort of area that I sort of mentioned earlier, so we, one sort of really interesting aspect is sort of coordinating appliances, coordinating um, UAVs for aerial um, imagery collection. Um, and I just want to show the, so I've spoken to a couple of people here quite a lot about our approach, which is sort of based on um, message passing. Um, so we, we, we we, we have a, a coordination problem and we represent it as a, as, a, as a message passing algorithm. So this is all nice. It comes from probabilistic inference. Um, and I just want to sort of skip on to, to the video, which is quite nice. Um, get past all this, which is actually trying to do it for real. So, so, that, so one of the key things in ORCID is, is not just to sort of um, try and do the algorithmic, it's to actually try and sort of do these things for real to sort of discover what the real problems are. Um, so this is some work the student did in the, at the Australian Centre for Field Robotics, where because um, Australia is so big, they, they seem to have their, they have their own flight test facility with their own runway. They have their own island in the Great Barrier Reef where they can run their sort of underwater vehicles. Um, so, so what we're, what we're going to see in the video um, 
oops, if it runs, is a message passing algorithm which is sort of based on the on the max sum algorithm, which is basically sort of uh, if you're familiar with graphical models, it's uh, oops. So this is basically sort of belief propagation in the graphical model. Um, here we're using it for utility optimization. So we're using the max sum algorithm rather than sort of uh, um, some product. Um, and what you're going to see in a second is this is, the, this is a, a factor graph that's running on real time on the two UAVs. So we've got two vehicles and we've got two aerial surveillance requests. So what, we'd, what we've, this is sort of the simplest coordination task you could come up with. You've got two vehicles and two tasks. Um, the task is, okay, I want to collect aerial imagery of this spot and this spot. So these are two people with PDAs standing on the ground and said, okay, I want aerial imagery from me. This guy says, I want aerial imagery here. You've got two, two UAVs, and the UAVs are doing the coordination task of deciding who should go where. So this is, clearly this is the simplest coordination task. Well, we could have, been, we could have had one task, <laughs> and it would have been a little bit simpler. Um, but this is about as simple as you can get um, in terms of coordination. But the key thing is that this is running uh, sort of a graphical model, um, or max sum, and so it's running max sum over this, this graphical model. And what, what this is representing is the utilities of the different UAVs doing the task. We do message passing over the graphical model, which in reality turns out to be message passing from each UAV to, to a man on the ground and, and, and back again. Um, and the message propagation basically solves the, the coordination problem and they decide where to go. So we'll just let that run. So we've done a lot of work on, on, the, on the, sort of the coordination mechanism and the algorithms. Um, and, this, and this is really just sort of an illustration that we're sort of trying to do a lot of this stuff for real. Um, so these are, this is the aerial imagery coming from the, from the UAVs. You, know, you can see one task is now completed and they're both sort of reassigned um, to the other one. Here's a slightly more complex setting. So I've spoken to a few people this morning about max sum coordination to do this sort of this uh, these sort of task allocation tasks. So this is it really sort of happening for real. So now we've got just one task at the moment. You're going to see both of the UAVs are going to end up being assigned to that task. They'll start flying towards it, and then another task comes, um, and then they make a decision as as to who should who should go where. Um, the flight control of the UAVs is pretty poor, so they <laughs> they uh, they they fly to to waypoints and you, so you can sort of see them, they reach a waypoint, the, they circulate around it and they fly on a little bit. That's sort of the, uh, the Australian Centre didn't trust our coordination mechanism so they put lots of sort of safety steps in the way which was a, which was a little bit annoying um, because it actually works in the, nicely in the end. Um, and here's the last time, so this is a little bit more interesting, sort of a little bit more interesting factor graph. So now we're going to see three tasks but there's some sort of constraints on the task so only one so here, this guy can do this task or this task, and then we're going to add in another task in a second. So now there's three tasks, there's some sort of local constraints, so this guy can only do some subset of them, but exactly the same coordination algorithm is just sort of passing messages between the, the, the things on the ground. So the, 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 the factor of the factor graph is on the ground, the, the variable of the factor graph is in the UAV, and the message passing is the, is the message passing up and down, up and down here. So we're trying to, so this is sort of the input from the Australian Centre for Field Robotics, trying to take what are essentially sort of graphical model-based coordination algorithms and really sort of try them in reality. And actually, you, un, you, you discover all sorts of constraints that you've sort of ignored in terms of synchronisation and, and how do you know that messages got there um, and all the, all the, all the sort of real-world features that it's very easy to abstract away when you sort of simulate these things on your, on your desktop machine. Okay, and just very quickly, I just want to mention last little things. I mentioned quite a lot about Galaxy Zoo. So the citizen science is a very interesting angle. We're very interested in, in crowdsourcing, how you can sort of get people in the crowd to contribute. So this is work getting people who are, you know, we want people to look at this and, and, and classify, you know, what sort of galaxy do they think it is. This is, an in, this is a project that we just sort of started off, which is quite fun. Um, 
I, uh, the New Forest is sort of a, a national park just next to Southampton. It's the home of a cicada, which is the only native cicada in the UK. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been heard for 12 years, so it might still be there, might not be. But it has this very interesting feature that it, the song is at 14 kilohertz, which is almost on the edge of most people's hearing. And it may, may be beyond, beyond the speakers. So it's, typically, you, you're not really hearing 14 kilohertz. You're hearing the, the sort of the speaker, um, the amplitude modulation from the speaker. Um, so this has got a really interesting aspect. Actually, you know, the, there's two people, two experts, who are looking around the New Forest, looking for this thing, trying to listen for it. Um, but every year, there's about 3 million day visitors to the New Forest, mainly of those with smartphones. And the question is, and, and actually, the smart, your smartphone can, can hear this thing very easily and actually detect it very easily. So it's a very characteristic sound. It has a very characteristic frequency and a very characteristic repeating sort of amplitude modulation, which is very easy for a phone to hear. It's hard for adults beyond sort of 45 to hear. Um, I think the average age of, of residents in the New Forest is well beyond that. So that may be why it hasn't been heard for sort of 10 years or so. Um, and, but so this is an interesting project. How can we use devices that many people are sort of wandering around with um, that have this capability? Um, they've already got sensors built in, sort of a microphone, a very sensitive microphone that will go up to sort of 20 kilohertz. And how can we sort of encourage and incentivize people who are visiting to, to pull out their iPhone as they're sort of walking around and if they hear an interesting sound to record it and upload it to us? So we can do some detection automatically on the phone, but the key thing we want is a... Is a is a date stamped GPS geolocated recording of a new forest cicada um, as evidence that it still exists somewhere in the, in the new forest. Um, so they, these, these things, they live underground for six years, they come out the ground, live for about two weeks, sing during that time, and then they, they plant their eggs and then they're in the ground for another eight years. So, so it could be there still, or it could be gone. Um, and, 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 and if we find it, it would be great, but um, I've told the PhD student who's doing this that he, he can't get his PhD if we don't find it. So <laughs> <laughs> I figured that would be good incentive. Okay, so I'll leave it there. So it's that the, the, the end was very rushed, but the questions were great. So I think the, the heating work is really interesting. And I think it's, it's something that sort of has lots of impact on, on everyone. You know, it's very familiar to everyone. Um, the website has lots more details, and my website has sort of um, all the publications, so all the work on the heating and the crowdsourcing. The, there's the, the papers on there. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.